Welcome to the Need for Async talk. And yeah, just a short intro about me, then I want to ask about you guys, who you are. So I'm Conrad Malawski. I work at the company soon to be previously known as TypeSafe, because we are in the middle of a rename. So the company isn't disappearing, we're just renaming. And I work on the ACA team, and I was also part of the Reactive Streams initiative, where I did the technology compatibility kit. Other than that, uh, part of program committee on Java 1, the Emerging Languages track, I run the Geekon conference, and a bunch of stuff in Krakow, including the Scala user group, the Software Craftsmanship Reading Club, and the Polish jug, which, practically speaking, is the Krakow jug, in case you're confused about that one. So, uh, enough about me. I really need to know uh, who I'm talking to today, because there's going to be a lot of um, comparisons, maybe, and kind of digging into your previous experience. So, um, do we have like people who have actually worked with C or like low-level things? Okay, good. But most of you guys are probably Java people, right? It's a Java conference. Yeah, that's what I expected. Do we have any Scala developers? Just, oh, cool, very cool. So, and feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions or, or anything. We have a lot of time. So, what does this talk about? This talk is about the, well, the, the big things that impact performance. What do I mean by that? I mean that if you properly design an algorithm to perform well, this actually has impact on performance. B just adding bit fiddling and maybe optimizing a plus into some bit operations is not going to change performance much. So this is a quote from Martin Thompson basically saying that. So, but performance is about fundamental design principles. So this talk is about fundamental design principles. There's not going to be much um, actual code that you will be applying in your day job, but a lot of this stuff is very relevant to any job if you're doing anything with computers. So that's the agenda. We're going to start with um, very simple stuff, like what is synchronous code, what is asynchronous code, and then we're going to go deeper into the scalability end of things. And then we'll end up in some examples of distributed systems and how asynchronous code is basically the only way to go in distributed systems. Otherwise, you're lying to yourself. So, uh, when I did this talk once uh, before, uh, a lot of feedback was, yeah, but why? Um, because there is a lot of, this is how you do it, but not a lot of why. So I added a bunch of why slides. So the primary reason why I'm doing this talk is because the free lunch is over. I hope you guys know the quote. It's about that we cannot just slap a bigger machine and it magically goes faster. We suddenly have to think about multi-core processing and design a system to be able to leverage this multi-core system. And I also want to explain like, the how and why a synchronous code actually helps with scalability and performance. And my goal in this entire thing is to have you guys well informed so you can make well informed decisions about frameworks and tools that you're using and not just follow a random buzzword. For example, reactive. Okay, great buzzword, very buzzy, but is there actually some meat behind it or not? So the goal is to have you guys informed enough to be able to defend or bash with data such buzzwords. Okay, basics. This is synchronous. Synchronous means request, I wait for the response, and then I do the next request, right? Very easy. So asynchronous means I send a message, and I send another message, and I send another message. But you see, the second reply came before the first reply, right? By first, I mean reply for the first request, right? So suddenly, in a asynchronous system, we need to take care of reordering, right? things do not always happen in the same order as we issued the command. So this is kind of basic stuff, but even this trips people off sometimes, right? Because you're used to an asynchronous model that things happen in order, and it's easy to reason about, but once you go async, you need to either explicitly enforce the ordering, or just abandon it. Why would you abandon ordering? Well, we'll see a bunch of examples for that, but basically, if you abandon ordering, you can do things much faster, because you're not waiting in a synchronous fashion, because you issue more work. So, first example. Um, there's going to be a lot of stickmen in this presentation. So when I draw a stickman, um, like that, 
I mean uh, one of many things. Uh, it could be a processor, just like that. It could be a thread, it could be an actor, but practically speaking, this is some guy that can, in parallel, process other things, uh, things with some other guy, right? So it's like a being, like an actor. I'm gonna be using the word actor because, well, that's what I'm mostly working with, but it applies to threads as well. So, uh, imagine that these three guys, these are actors, and actors work like that, that they take a message from their mailbox, read it, and do stuff with it, right? So, down below you see the processors. We have one yellow processor and one blue processor. So, an actor, in order to process anything, needs to get the CPU time. So this is what I'll be drawing here as with colorful lines and the X scale is the time, right? So now this middle actor got the yellow processor. Now the, blue, uh, the top actor got the blue CPU. What does this mean for the guy below? Well, it means that he's effectively blocked. What do I mean by effectively blocked? Well, he's not really blocking on any operation, but he can't really get CPU time. So we only have two actual processors in this system. So in reality, we can only do two things at the same time. And let's not talk about hyperthreading because that's just cheating. It's the same thing. So, and every time we have processed a message, an actor can give up the thread. So say, hey, I'm done. Now you can have the thread again. Or it, or it can keep the thread and keep processing other messages. This is what we refer to as scheduling in all kinds of systems. So every time I'm done with something, there's this decision, do I keep the thread or do I leave it and someone else can take it. So let's say that yeah, now the bottom one got the CPU time, the yellow one, because the middle one uh, didn't. And we see this red line is kind of sp sprinkling up in, in the middle thing again. So what this situation is referred to in scheduling is, well, not completely fair scheduling, because the guy in the middle is not really given the same amount of time as the other guys. So this is an actual problem and causes the same effect, almost as if someone would be blocking in the system. But actually, no one is. It's just that the scheduling isn't completely fair. But a blocking example is down in the third actor, so the gray thing. So let's say I'm writing to disk or I'm going to a database in a synchronous call. What that means is that this actor is blocking, as in awaiting for this thing to complete, and basically wasting time. What do I mean by wasting? Because, well, I could be doing other things with this thread, because it is not the thread that is doing the work, it is the database that is doing the work, and basically I need to wait for it. So how would the same thing look in a asynchronous system? So you see the gray line now is, I just issue a command, and I tell the database or the driver or something, hey, if you're done, just tell me, and the reply comes back into the mailbox. And during that time, we can use the CPU in the middle actor, so we're not wasting resources, CPU time, right? So, first lesson learned today, do not block, no parking at any time and that blocking is indistinguishable from just being very slow or being unlucky with scheduling. So, now let's do a small quiz. What is latency? Which of the lines is latency? If you think latency is the yellow thing, hand up. Okay, if you think it's the blue thing, hand up. Okay, so the blue thing is winning. Well, actually, this is latency. And let, let me define that, actually, by saying the obvious. This is latency by the queuing theory, theory definitions. And the problem is, very often in um, yeah, computer science, at work, etc., in papers even, latency is often convoluted with response time. Another question is, when you're talking with someone and you talk about latency, are you guys talking about the same thing or not? Because some people understand it as the blue line, some people understand it as the yellow line. And as long as you understand the same thing, you, you can refer to it like whatever. But this is really important to get a common understanding of the words. 
So by the rest of representation, I will be using latency as response time, but I wanted to, to clear that out because sometimes we forget about this guy. So what is the green line? So green line is, did someone say? Okay, so the green line is service time. And it's really important because like you noticed in the previous example, if service time takes a lot of time, it's very slow to process this one request, then the entire response time suffers, of course, right? So it's not really, if we're tuning latency of our networks, but the service time is slow anyway, well, we're not gonna improve the whole thing as much as we could. So we need to focus on measuring the right thing and then optimizing the right thing, right? Because sometimes we measure latency through network, right? Or just time from sending the message to accepting the message. Well, this is not the whole picture. We need to measure everything, both things, latency and service time. Okay, so another quiz. Okay, hands up, and this is gonna be a re re rather weird question, but is latency, like a 10 second latency, a applicable and fine in your application, like on your day job, like one, for one request? Okay, we have a guy who thinks it's fine. So is 200 milliseconds fine for one request? Yeah, more people raise their hands. And, and I'm curious at, uh, which, at which point in time you'll notice that these are trick questions. <laughs> but they are. What do I mean by trick questions? Let me ask the last one. So you, you see it's more or less the same idea. So is it between 20 milliseconds and one minute? Right? So now you're starting to talk about the distribution of the latency in your system. Right? So maybe not every request has to be below 200, but it would be good if like all of them would be below a minute because, well, maybe then people die. So. Instead, what we should talk about is, if you design an SLA, you guys have SLAs in your day job? Like, this request has to be this fast? How, how does it look like? Is it more like uh, the, the second example here? It has to be 200 millisecond max. Is that what SLAs look like? Usually they do, in my experience as well. And what I found is, this is not a very healthy way to formulate the SLAs, because of course you can squeeze performance out of everything, but is it worth your time? Are you actually making more money if every request is below a certain threshold? Maybe if 90% is you know, below 200 and then other percentiles are just, you know, all right. Not very fast, but all right. Okay, the other problem with that is even with high percentiles and you have a, a 99, 9999, percentile being like 100 milliseconds, if you have a lot of requests coming in, the probability of someone hitting the, the really high percentile during an interaction with your website is actually pretty big. Because when you go to a website, uh, you request a bunch of resources. Sometimes it's 100 web, web, web calls, maybe internally on your servers. And suddenly, because every request from the user becomes 100 requests in the entire application, well, it becomes really easy to hit the 99th, 99th percentile. Another thing I um, sometimes see developers reply when I ask about you know, what's your latency or how is your system performing is this. So our response time is 200 on average and standard deviation is 60. So when I ask, yeah, so what's your um, 99th, 99th percentile? And then they apply normal distribution to it. Okay, who knows why this is wrong? Hands up. Okay, good guys. But for the rest, you really need to think about latency being not a normal distribution. Because it's not, it's spiky. It's very weird because sometimes there's a lot of spikiness in your traffic and sometimes there isn't. And it's by no means a normal distribution. So what do I mean by that um, and by do not apply uh, standard deviation to calculating these things. Well, standard deviation only makes sense for normal distribution. So, you basically calculated a thing assuming the wrong model of your distribution. So, don't. So, how can you measure the 99th percentile properly? 
Well, by actually measuring at the 99th, 99, whatever. How, how, however much you want to measure, you need to measure at that percentile. You cannot invent data. Okay, now let's talk about actually measuring stuff. So this is a graph, you don't really need to read it. Uh, I'm gonna explain what it is. So this is uh, from um, Jay Hiccup. It's a tool um, from Azure Systems, but basically what it says, you attach an agent to your JVM, and a hiccup is defined as yeah, how much time your JVM was doing nothing. Okay, so here the red things are the hiccups, and you can see, okay, so once in a while it has this hiccup. Not very good, what, what can we do with that? But uh, one thing it doesn't show is how this behavior is spread through the percentile distribution of your of your requests and response times. So what we can graph instead, instead of just time versus the hiccups, we can draw something like that. So we take all the response times, draw the percentiles, and on the um, y-axis we draw how much it took time. And now we can, like I said in the last example on the SLAs, draw a line, the yellow line, which is the SLA. You can actually draw the SLA on a graph and compare it with your actual performance, right? So when you have a graph like that, you, you need to actually look into it, like what is happening? So this system has three modes of operation, right? First this flat operation, then somewhere around the 99th percentile was the first bump, and somewhere before the 99th comma 99 percentile there's another bump, and then it gets worse. So the reason this is interesting is you know where you need to optimize. So sometimes people just pull out the profiler and start profiling, but the problem is with profiling you add some overhead and you'll most likely start optimizing the middle mode, not the highest mode, because you added some overhead anyway. So you need to think about your system, what is happening? And when you look at these shapes, after some time, you'll start to recognize patterns. Okay, so look, you look at the system, it reminds you of this, it's, I think it's a snake, but then you rem rem remember, ha, huh, this this elephant. And by elephant, what do I mean? Sometimes in your systems you have a queue size, or, um, so if you have this many requests, and you see, oh yeah, then the queue will be really full, or maybe then the cache will be blasted, that kind of things. And suddenly you see this point in time where this system bumps into this other mode of operation. When you see um, like fine lines like that, it's usually some uh, queue buildup. If the, queue, if the line gets more straight up dynamically, then it's probably just stop the world problems. Someone is stalling. So by just looking at these, distri by at these graphs, you have some intuition where to look. So it's not a solution, but it is a hint. So, what do we actually want to optimize in systems, normally? Normally, we need to optimize for tail latency. So tail latency means the thing to the far right. Right? Yes, to the right. So tail is the more percentile, like more nines, right? You usually need to optimize that one. So. Uh, thing we learned in this section, uh, use, per, use precise language in order to know what you're actually talking about with someone when you're negotiating a contract or defining an SLA, and trust no one, basically. You need to actually measure the data, and then from the measured data you can s give an informed response. You cannot make up data. It's really not a good idea with any kind of measuring of latencies, response times, or pauses, or any kind of that kind of thing. So, different topic. Okay, so we'll talk about concurrent algorithms. Everybody knows what a concurrent algorithm is? And keep your hand up if you still know what we're talking about here. So, lock free. Okay, few. And wait free. Less hands. Good, so this is exactly why I'm doing this talk to explain the differences here. So, a concurrent data structure is most easily defined as if I access it concurrently from multiple threads, for example, it doesn't blow up. That's basically it, a layman's definition. 
So a concurrent data structure can be easily implemented with just locks, right? So let's say I have a, a value, a variable, an atom, not an atomic, a variable to which I want to write. So whoever wants to perform the write needs to take a lock. So A tries to write, B tries to write, B wins, and A tries to write again, D wins, and again, and again, and again, and again. So you see A is retrying all over the time again, and other threads are successfully winning. So what is the moral of this example? There's two. One is thread A is a complete loser. Uh, the second one, thread A may never make progress. And while this is um, not strictly um, the best way to show it, it's, uh, I think, very visual. Now let's talk about uh, the lock example. So A tries to write, it took a lock, and it really never gets to act on it. This is a more visual and more highlighting of the problem uh, example. So A is still a complete loser, and it still may never make progress. The difference between those two is, in the first one, we keep retrying, and in this example, the second one, we try once, and we're stuck. No good. How can this happen? Well, it can only happen with blocking APIs. So this is copied from the... Um, I forgot which class. From the blocking array queue uh, implementation in JDK. Yeah. So it has a bunch of methods uh, which you can use to put a value into the queue. The first one, that's the nicest one actually. You can offer a value, and then the queue says if it had placed enough space to put the value into the queue, it says, okay, true, I put it into the queue, or it says false. And then you can retry and retry again. The other one is a bit less nice because it's using uh, exceptions to signal the same thing. So if it wasn't able to put in the value, it will throw an exception. And the last one, which is uh, the horror, <laughs> don't use it. Why, why, that? why not? Because it blocks until it's able to put in the value, right? So basically, we're again losing control of the thread and we can't do anything about it. And actually, it's kind of funny because the Boolean per, uh, return value here, well, it's always going to be true because it blocks until it's going to be true. So, well. So, let's talk about lock free. Uh, a lot of people raised their hands, and yes, this is also sometimes called uh, lockless algorithms. But the idea is basically this. Let me illustrate it in an animation. Will it animate? Yes, it does. So this is lock-free programming. <laughs> in lock-free programming, and you see, no one is really crashing into each other. So it's doing pretty well, and it's really fast, because there's no synchronization. There's no locks, even when the people come. Yeah. So um, this is a very good example of a lock-free algorithm, because no one is even crashing into each other. But actually, in lock-free algorithms, it is perfectly fine and expected for the cars to crash into each other, and then they decide, oh, that was no good, let's try again. And they crash into each other again, until they succeed. Uh, I'm going to um, do a nice example of that one in a second. Basically, lock-free means, if we run sufficiently long, so I will try to cross the crossing as many times as it takes, I will cross it at some point. I will cross it. So, if threads run sufficiently long, at least one of them makes progress. This is the formal definition. So, always one person, one thread is able to make progress. How does it look in an implementation? So, here I'm using Scala, but the general idea applies to any language, actually, because the core of this algorithm is actually compare exchange. So, it's um, an opcode implemented by most processors nowadays, Intel is at least, and the Intel family. So compare exchange takes two values, compares them. If they are equal, it it's swaps in the third, second value that you, gave it, that you gave it. So in this example, it's compare and set. I compare the Q to a Q value that I got in the first line on the, of, of this method. So I do Q 
I get my cue from the atomic reference, and then I try to append to it. And then, if during that time, when I was doing the appending, the cue didn't change, the reference inside the atomic reference didn't change, then I actually execute the swap. And if I didn't, I will try again. Like I said, I will keep crashing the cars until I succeed. This is basically it. How does it look in more pictures? I like pictures. So you have the queue, two threads are trying to write to it. So both get the reference, they prepend some value to it. And then they try the CAS. So CAS is short for compare and swap. Uh, you try to CAS, you try to put it into a black box, and you have a CAS succeed. So you're done. The thread number two is done. However, thread number one tries to do the exact same thing, but you see it's slightly after the first compare and swap operation. So this only works because the compare and swap operation is atomically imp implemented on CPUs. And yeah, we can, Im we can emulate these things with logs, but in this case, it's an atomic operation on the CPU. So always there's going to be someone first and someone second. There is no concurrent access. So here we lose the race and we try again. And then when we get the reference again, we see, oh, it has this yellow value, we prepend the value again, and now we succeed. Easy. So this is the wild cars, keeping crashing the cars. So I do want to talk about weight-free, because it's an interesting uh, category of algorithms, but we're not going to dive into an actual implementation. Why, you're going to see in a second. But the formal definition is really interesting and sometimes important, depending on what you need to implement. So a weight-free algorithm is kind of like the log-free thing. However, there is an upper bound on the number of retries you have to do, after which you are guaranteed to make progress. So basically it says, hey, in this data structure, uh, at most you will need to retry five times, and I guarantee then you will have your value written. Right? So it's more fair in that sense. So by weight free, we mean there is this upper bound. So like I said, um, there is a lot of implementations of these things, and one of them, a quite wonderful one, is the concurrent linked queue. Have a read if you like to, but we're not going to dive deep into it. I just wanted to highlight that you can do better than lockless. If you really need to, you can just light, light the light bulb in your, in your head and notice, oh yeah, there's this other category of algorithms I could apply here. So, there's different ways to write concurrent data structures, and sometimes you need to reach for the more crazy ones, and sometimes you don't. It all depends on the use case. Wh what is this um, use case, right? How, how do I find the right um, data structure for my thing? So. One of the things you should look at is how contended is this area I'm trying to write. Surprisingly, uh, more often than not, uh, using a plain old synchronized is actually pretty good. Why? Okay, now people are frowning. What? What are you saying? Actually, it's pretty good because the plain good old Java way of writing things is slap synchronized at stuff. Well, this is not very good because it makes execution serial. So what did JVMs do by after these many years? We have 20 years of Java, so there's 20 years plus of research into this. They are great at eliding these things. So we call this biased locking. So if the JVM notices, yeah, I think there's not gonna, there's not gonna be any concurrent access here. It will just elide the locks. So sometimes the simplest tools are right, the right thing for the job. You don't always need to go into the crazy ones, but when you do, at least you know which ones now. Different topic. Like I said, a lot of different topics today. So I.O. Uh, Input-output, not the Google I.O. conference. Um, and there's also the I.A.I.O. And there's also N.I.O. And there's another one. Who cares to guess? It's zero, actually. Uh, I'm going to explain what I mean by zero. I mean the zero copy thing. So, first, we have synchronous I.O. And this is a quote from a fellow uh, developer at TypeSafe. He worked on the GNOME project, he implemented Dbus, and a lot of other stuff. So, he was a desktop developer. Good old C-style desktop development. Turns out, well, everything is event-based in desktop systems, right? So, when he came to a Java Enterprise app, like, where the hell is my event loop, right? Give me the thread. 
So, interruption. Okay, what? <laughs> I hope you got the joke. So, interruptions. If you have a box, down below, it actually works on interruptions, right? You know what, you know what that is, but let's see how it impacts actual I.O., right? So we have user space and we have kernel space. Quick show of hands, who knows about user space and kernel space? Okay, good, so I don't need to explain too much. So basically, we have two modes of a, pre of a processor. I hope you guys know this is a mode of a processor, a physical thing. The processor has to go from one mode to the other mode. It's not a kernel thing. The actual processor changes the way it addresses memory. Okay? And it takes time. So I'm very sorry, but I don't have an exact measurement on recent CPUs. However, on a Pentium 4, such a kernel mode switch uh, took yeah, above a thousand cycles. This is quite a lot of time. It's 400 nanoseconds. You can do a lot of stuff during 400 nanoseconds. And maybe this sounds, oh, this is so nano. This doesn't really apply to my uh, boring web app. Well, it actually does. Let's see how. Okay, so we have these two states. And when you want to read a file, you're actually not doing the read. The kernel has to go into kernel mode, and you do that by issuing a syscall. So what are syscalls? Syscalls are something that you tell, this, um, tell the kernel, hey kernel, please do this for me. It's slightly different from just invoking a function. So when the kernel says, okay, CPU, I need, ker I need kernel mode. It switches the mode and then issues the read, and then you get back the data, and then you can issue the write, and you issue a syscall write, and then you get back from the write. As you can see, this is blocking I.O., so all the time we are waiting for the read and writes to complete. But this is not the worst thing. So what is the worst thing? This is the worst thing. What is this? Change of context, yes. And there's even more evilness. I mean, don't worry, it only gets worse. What is even worse here? It's the buffers. Okay, let me talk about buffers now. So because the kernel can only, well, it can address any buffer, but it does not really. It addresses the kernel buffer. So a buffer allocated in the kernel space. And then, in order to hand it over to the user space, it needs to copy the entire chunk of data. So we have one entire read into the kernel buffer. Then we do an array copy into the user space buffer. And then we issue the write. So we need to copy the data from the user space buffer to the socket buffer, for example, if you're sending it over to TCP or something. Same thing with files. So you see, there's a lot of useless copying of data. And each time you issue in that kind of um, command, it does copy the data. So four mode switches and data in three, uh, three buffers. So for those who don't know, Linux I.O. means asynchronous I.O. and it's kind of exposed to us as NIO on the JVM, which expands to, who knows, new I.O. since 2004. So no one is calling it new anymore, but we're just calling it NIO, right? And NIO2. Okay, so what can we do with asynchronous I.O.? Asynchronous I.O. works like that. We can issue a read and say, okay, you do the read, here's my buffer, and uh, please fill it with data. And when you're done, give me a callback. So you see there's this callback, and we are not being blocked in user space. Okay? But it still does the same amount of copying. It's just not blocking the thread. So now we have to do a trade-off. Do we prefer to be non-blocking, as this, or do we prefer to work smarter, but not harder? What do I mean by that? Avoid the copying of data. So, there is a special instruction in the Linux kernel. It's called send file. But actually, if you um, try to read up on it, uh, look for the term zero copy. And while it's not uh, practically zero copy, it's one copy, the name kind of stuck. So what do I mean by zero copy? So you say to the kernel, hey kernel, please send file from this file descriptor to this file descriptor. Okay? And the kernel will do exactly that. It reads from the disk, and in, in this example, I'm uh, sending some piece of data from a file to a TCP socket. I'm reading, well, the kernel is reading from the disk into the kernel space buffer, and then directly 
it sends the data from the kernel buffer onto the socket. So practically speaking, yes, it is still one copy, but it is being referred to as zero copy. And the best thing is it never leaves the kernel space. This is a trade-off, because if I need to do data transformation, I can't use this, because I'm going to do my data transformation in user space, right? So I can't do this in these cases. But if you're a, I don't know, image server, this is really good for those kinds of use cases. So when I first found it, I was like, oh, my glob. <laughs> OK, lessons learned. Avoid wasting CPU time. Asynchronous I.O. will not be faster than synchronous I.O., usually. Um, so asynchronous seek will always be faster. I mean, disks are optimized for that. And even RAM is optimized for that. People claim it's arbitrary access. Well, yes and no. It still is nicer if you just go through an array and copy data. So throughput-wise, you're not going to be faster than uh, synchronous seeks. However, there's one interesting uh, feature here. So because multiple uh, readers may be issuing the same read. So in synchronous I.O., maybe you have a very, very popular file on your website, some image, some very nice image. So everybody wants to read that image. With asynchronous I.O., because you're just issuing this command, multiple readers are issuing the co command to read this picture, the kernel can be smart enough to just read it once and then serve it. And then there's, of course, other things like page caches, and, but let's not go over today. OK, another problem. We talked about performance, more or less. Let's talk about scalability. And these are quite orthogonal things. Please remember that. So if you talk about scalability, you'll most likely need to sacrifice some performance. You'll see why. Uh, OK, so C10K. Who has heard the term? OK, so I'll explain it a bit more than the previous sections. So C10K means uh, 10,000 concurrent connections, and it's by no means a new thing. But why am I talking about it? I'm talking about it exactly because not many people raise their hands. And it's very interesting for us in the kind of current landscape of technologies because it basically talks about the core of servers, how we can scale servers to more connections per host. Why is, it, why is this relevant again after so many years? Well, because now with uh, so many mobile phones or whatnot, the number of clients, so for example, my mobile phone versus the number of servers is growing, right? Everybody has a phone, or five. Um, so we need to take more traffic on the same box. And sometimes this traffic means uh, keeping the connection open, all that kind of things. So let's talk about um, maybe first the small font down below here. So back in the day, when the C10K problem was first attacked, it was basically a comparison well, Apache, D, Apache HTTP, HTTPD doesn't really scale to 10,000 connections per box. Nowadays, you'll probably be able to do this on one box, but like I said, it's an old problem. So why, why didn't it? Why doesn't it? Um, because it's using the one thread per connection model, same as uh, Tomcat servers or servlet containers in general, right? You have this one thread per request, but what if it's a long-lived connection? You need to keep the thread alive. And, well, threads, even on native, um, a thread is not for free, right? It's not free lunch. But on the JVM, it's even worse. So who knows how much just starting a thread costs memory-wise? You can shout. Actually, no. Um, a mag. Seriously. It's, a, it's an option, you can configure it, but it reserves uh, one meg of memory per thread. Why does it do it? For the stack, because you have stack, stack space. Every thread has some stack in which it can allocate stuff. And allocating in the thread local allocation buffer is way faster than allocating in some shared place. So every thread has this small buffer, well, small, a meg, to be very fast when it allocates there, because it's not contending with any other allocator in that space. So it's um, trying to do the right thing. It tries to keep your thread happy and allocate it, uh, make it allocate fast. But it comes with a cost. 
So let's uh, switch gears again, and I want to talk about sockets. Yay, sockets. Who, who programmed sockets in Java? It's horrible, right? So, um, random story. So when I first learned Java, I figured, yeah, I have this Java book, and it's talking about sockets, and it says this is web programming. So I figured, okay, I want to make a game. I was pretty young. And if this is web programming, I will have to do sockets. Okay. Yeah, the, the name of the game never got finished. Exactly, that's why, because sockets. But let's talk about selecting sockets. So what is selecting sockets? So let's imagine I'm a web server, and I have a number of connections, right? And a list of connections. Sockets, basically. So in the uh, Paul API, so these are Linux APIs, but other operating systems basically have the same APIs. Um, Paul is pretty much standard nowadays. Uh, the next one, ePoll, is not standard at all, sadly. But it works like that. I need to poll the file descriptors. Um, I, I give uh, the kernel a data structure, which it can fill with the description of which connection is ready to be read or, writ or written to. I use a timeout, so if nothing is happening, this will not block. Well, it will block at most 100 milliseconds. So it's all right. Because if stuff is happening, it will just keep spinning. Then, because now I have data in my file descriptors, uh, data structure, I need to iterate over it, so on, and see which of these sockets actually has data to read. OK, let's, let's do that. But when you think about it, how often does this operation happen? This is not even per request. This is for every read of every chunk of data all the time. So having an operation that takes on and like all the time needs to spin and check that nothing is happening, basically, because maybe only three connections with the dots here have actual data, but I need to go over the entire array all the time, I'm, I'm wasting time. So of course, uh, this is not a new thing. And then ePoll arrived. So ePoll arrived uh, around the 2.6 uh, releases of, or maybe even sooner. Don't quote me on that. Um, probably I, I, I'm mistaken the kernel version. But it arrived in the kernel version of Linux, and it works like that. And it's basically designed to solve this exact problem. So it's basically kind of like callbacks, but, but in C. So what we're going to do is we're going to ePool create with a mask. I use coffee. And this basically means that I can watch this mask. So when I create a socket, I bind it to this mask. And then when I use ePool wait, which means, OK, kernel, so tell me which of these uh, has data to read or write from and to. And what the kernel will do is, hey, um, here's the events. And of course, it's C style, so you give it the data structure, and it writes into your data structure mutably, right? So in P events, you suddenly have the exact socket that have data available, right? So E6, E9, E10, like on the left-hand side. How is that better? Well, it's not strictly a one, um, because you still need to iterate for, through the ones that have data. But the change of when I start iterating through this data structure, the f on the beginning, there's always going to be those that actually have data. So I'm not wasting time, because I need to read from them anyway. And once I get to the end of it, so zeros, I see, OK, so the other ones don't have data available. And then you do it again and again. So while this is not something you touch directly, uh, it is something you encounter in your daily lives when you choose a HTTP server, right? So in Java, it's, um, it's actually implemented internally. So if the operating system has ePoll available, it will try to use it. If it's not able to, it's going to fall back to Paul. So it's not something we are directly exposed to in Java land. However, when you pick servers, yeah, think about that thing. And the lesson I want to tell you guys um, from, from this example is that ON is a no-go for epic scalability. If you just need you know, some scalability, then it's fine. But there is this trend then that if something is at the core of the algorithm and is implement, uh, being run all the time, sometimes ON is just not good enough. This, this touches stuff like selecting socket and Linux scheduling, or maybe just 
a random business algorithm that you have in your business. And maybe if you would implement this core thing that everyone uses in a ON fashion, O1 fashion, then everything is suddenly way faster. So the moral here is O1 is a go for epic scalability, right? And you just need to pick and choose where do we actually need to spend the time to go as crazy and implement such algorithm. Because it's not that hard. So, the last topic I want to touch on is distributed systems, which is my favorite area, I guess. So, quick recap, what is a distributed system? A distributed system is a system in which the failure of a computer you didn't even know existed can render your computer unusable. Perfect definition by Leslie Lamptot. Pretty much father of, uh, father of distributed computing, as some see it. What, what do we mean by this? Because it's, it may seem funny, but it's actually an awesome definition, because when do you have a distributed system? Well, if you have at least two nodes, two computers, and they need to communicate with each other to work, I don't know, you have a website and needs a database. The most boring example ever. But it's already two computers, there's an app server, there's a database server. If the database server goes down, the user can't access the website. Does the user know about the database server? No, and he shouldn't. But it basically proves that we have a distributed system once we have at least two nodes. And there is a, another thing about distributed systems. So the more machines you have, the weirder the behavior it exposes becomes. What do I mean by weird? Well, sometimes a disk crashes, a disk becomes, you know, uh, reads some not proper data, maybe a CPU is behaving weirdly, maybe a RAM crashes, all kinds of stuff happens. Maybe you think this is not very popular, uh, not very um, frequent. However, the more nodes you have, the, more, the higher the probability that some part of your system will fail. So instead of hiding the failures, let's embrace them. And here's going to be uh, two examples of algorithms which actually embrace failure. So backup requests is a technique for fighting the long tail latencies, so the higher percentiles, by issuing duplicated work. Okay, sounds wasteful. Yes, it is wasteful. So, um, why do I want to be wasteful? Because I want to hit my SLA, no matter what. So. It's better to issue some duplicated work than to not hit the SLA. So in this example, my SLA is uh, 300 milliseconds for this specific question. Question comes in, and I know, okay, uh, there's three servers which know the answer to this question, so I need to ask at least one of them. I decide to ask the first one, and you see, I also have a timer that says, um, yeah, 100 millisecond, and after 100 millisecond elapses, I will issue the same question to a bunch of replicas. Okay, so all these three guys, they have a replica of the data I'm asking for, so I can ask any of them. But if I see the first guy is not responding within 100 milliseconds, I ask some other guys. Basically, I start panicking and ask around, hey guys, do you know what's happening? So, it turns out, sometimes the second node maybe it's under less load, or maybe it's just a beefier machine or something, can reply faster than the first one. Faster as in even before the first one replied, right? So way faster. And then I can reply to my uh, users with, hey, I have the an answer. And I still hit my SLA. I had this funny timer here below, so you can see I hit my SLA. So does this seem weird? A little bit because we're delaying this initial question by 100 milliseconds, so we are giving up a bunch of time. Does it actually work? Surprisingly, yes. So the, uh, here are the papers if you want to read up on it. Uh, more specifically, it was applied in Google's uh, big table servers, where you basically have the same problem. You need to ask for some data. You know where the data lives, on one of three nodes, for example, and if you issue no backup requests, the 99,9 percentile, it's a second, guys, um, sorry. Okay, so if you issue a backup request after 10 milliseconds, look at the 99 percentile, 99,9 percentile. It's pretty good. 
And then you can even sacrifice even more time before you issue this backup request, and it's still pretty good, especially compared to the without backup request. So like I said, this is um, a very easy, simple algorithm. You can do it yourself, or you can just use a bunch of existing implementations. We have one in Akka, and I mentioned that because it was uh, created during a hackathon here in Krakow, so really not much work, but it saves a lot of your SLA. Um, dangered requests. So, I didn't finish the slide, it seems. Backup requests allow, allow what? Allow to trade off uh, duplicated work for battling latency problems, right? But you will be issuing more load into your cluster. So let's try to do the opposite. So let's say I am barely surviving the load that the traffic is uh, in doing to my system, and I need to apply some back pressure. So what is back pressure? It is not this. I mean, if your back is killing you, this is a back pain, not back pressure. So back pressure, no, 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 not that one. Back pressure is this. Back pressure means if you have two systems and one of them is slower than the publisher, let's call the big guy the publisher, the small guy the subscriber, uh, this is actually wording from the reactive stream spec I worked on with um, engineers from both TypeSafe and Pivotal and Red Hat and Netflix. Really interesting spec and you'll see a bunch of movements around it. However, the idea is this. If my upstream is faster than the downstream, I need to tell the guy somehow to slow down. So the protocol works like that. I say I am able to consume 10 messages. So it's a permit-based system. I always say how much I am ready to consume, and then the upstream can accumulate this demand. If the upstream sends data, it decreases this demand, so if he sends free requests, uh, free uh, messages, uh, he decrements the counter, and now it's seven. So he can still send seven messages, because in total I was ready to receive 10, and that didn't change. So, of course, does this increase latency? Maybe, but that's the point. It decreases, latency, uh, it decreases latency if the downstream is not able to cope with the incoming traffic. And this is exactly the point. We want to not fall down on our face. It's not a pleasant thing to do. So, how does it work in a setting where we have some backend server and we have some frontend server that is getting this um, request? So the backend guy can say, okay, I'm ready now, and it gives you some number of uh, messages that is, is able to consume now. And now you can issue a combined request. So notice that I am not sending the, uh, the T1, T2, T3 messages unless I got demand from the downstream, which means there is some time lag, right? In this time, I can keep collapsing these messages into one message that is combining this question. Sometimes in a, um, let's say this is a SQL database, sometimes selecting with multiple work clauses is still more efficient than issuing the, a bunch of selects, right? It all depends on your data, but you can do a combined request like that. And even more interesting, someone is calling me. Not anymore. So, uh, even more interestingly, because, let's say this is a web page, and web pages are pretty known for requesting the same kind of data all the time. So what, what you can do in this kind of situation is, I notice that these three messages are basically asking for the same thing. And I collapse it, again, same technique, but I just ask for the thing once. And when, when I get the response, I reply to all the three people who asked the question. I don't need to ask three times. Okay. so. A uh, lesson learned from this one is back pressure can save systems from overload and it's more, v more real than you actually think it is. When we work with customers, uh, sometimes, yeah, okay, performance problems, you can just work on them. But adding back, back pressure to a system which isn't really ready for it is even harder, which is why the reactive streams um, kind of appeared and it's a standard protocol which Rx, Akka and Reactor and a bunch of other implementations implement. So now you can connect through reactive streams and have this back pressure built in. You, you don't touch it directly, but it works like I just described. Not very complicated, but it solves the problem. 
So let's wrap up. I have four minutes and then open for questions. So wrapping up, um, you don't need to be a great mechanic to be a great racing driver. But you kind of should understand how your bullet works. Right? When I push the brake, what is actually happening? When I switch a gear, what is actually happening? Right? This much we hopefully know about cars, and if you want to be a great racer, you probably know a bunch of other things about your bullet, your car. So this is exactly the message I'm trying to convey here. Most of this stuff, you won't be using or implementing it directly. Heck, some of this stuff is uh, in the kernel level, right? Even implementers like um, when you write ACA, when you write, I don't know, um, other high-performance things, you don't implement these syscalls, right? You just know that they exist and you know how to use them. So this is my, my message here. I just wanted to make you guys aware of these things. So be aware that someone has to bite the bullet and do the horrible mutable thing sometimes, and that we're all running on real hardware, and the hardware can also expose some quirky behavior sometimes. Libraries do it for you. You just need to be aware and conscious about picking the right one. And yeah, um, we do implement most of these things in ACA. It's just mini pitch. So um, a bunch of links. Um, really, really good talks I recommend you guys look into. And the, the big ones I recommend even more. So juggling razor blades is about lockless concurrency in C++, which surprisingly looks pretty much the same as in Java. It was quite surprising. <laughs> and then uh, a wonderful talk from Schmookon, because C10K was like 13 years old, right? So the current uh, challenge is to have 10 million concurrent connections on one server. And it's a really interesting talk, even though uh, most of us don't have this problem. It del delves into how the kernel sometimes is just too slow. Like I said, an interesting talk. And a lot of thanks for people who both inspired and um, provided me with reviews and feedback for this talk. If you want to learn more, there's a bunch of communities we run in Krakow and, uh, and not in Krakow. Specifically, um, the Krakow Scholar User Group is going to do a performance benchmarking hackathon soon, so if you're interested in that stuff, let me know. So, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. We have a few minutes right now, or just grab me on the corridor. Do we have... <laughs>